He is the main guy. Yeah. Nothing happens without him. So you can you can share, unshare, mute, unmute. Yeah. Anything. Anything happens. So don't don't make him too unhappy. Otherwise he will mute you. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Okay, we are live, sir. Hi. Uh, good evening, everybody. It's a great pleasure uh, for me on behalf of uh, KEY, the Society of Knee Surgeons of India, and Ortho TV to welcome you all for this uh, webinar. This is a unique webinar, first of its kind, where we will be discussing on principles and analysis of deformity correction in the lower limb in adults. And for this, uh, I'm very thankful to Professor Herzenberg and uh, uh, Dr. Asaya uh, for having consented to join this unique webinar. Before I go on to introduce them, first of all, let me wish both of them a very happy Independence Day. It's their 244th Independence Day and uh, let me on behalf of Key Ortho TV and all the Indian Orthopedic Committee uh, community wish you a very very happy Independence Day. So, uh, Ashok, can we have the first slide? And uh, yeah, go back. Yeah, back, back. Okay. So this, uh, as I was just saying, is uh, under the ages of Ski and. Uh, the Ortho TV. I'm also joined by Dr. Sachin Tapaswi and Ashok Sham, who are the key members of SKI, and uh, also Dr. Shamshul Huda, Dr. Uh, Neeraj, and uh, again Ashok Sham, who are the key members of Ortho TV. And uh, on behalf of all of them, I welcome you for this webinar. The next slide. So, as I said, 4th of July, Happy Independence Day to uh, Professor Herzenberg and uh, Dr. Asayag and all the people who are viewing us uh, from the United States. Next. Dr. Professor Herzenberg needs no introduction. He is not new to us. He's been to India once, but even though he has been only once, he's uh, widely acclaimed and known not only in India, but across the globe. He's a director of pediatric uh, 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 orthopedic department, Sinai Hospital of Baltimore. And he's also the director of International Center for Limb Lengthening Rubin Institute and is also director for the Limb Reconstruction uh, Fellowship. And uh, he is at the Sinai Hospital in Baltimore, Maryland. Next. Next slide, Ashok. He also uh, runs a very busy uh, education and a training program and uh, has held various prestigious positions of uh, being the past president of Asami, he's been the past president of the Maryland Orthopedic Association, an honorary member of Israel Orthopedic Association also. Next. He has written many books, all of us know about it, and most of them are on the limb reconstruction, on deformity correction, and also uh, runs a one-year intense program of, for limb lengthening and for deformity correction. Next. He has uh, received many awards. Just to mention a few of them are from the, uh, one of them is from the American Orthopedic Association of North America. He received the traveling fellowship. He is being mentioned in the top doctors uh, of the United States by Castle Connolly and has also received the AOAS Achievement Award. Next. He's done great social work. He travels uh, to North America, to South America, to Africa to do various surgeries. He's also a visiting professor to various other states in the United States as well as other countries. He's been as a visiting professor to Japan, Canada, uh, Germany, and many other countries. Next. Uh, he also was the course director of the first ever lower limb deformity course, which was held in Pune from 14th to 16th November, not very long ago. So uh, thank you very much for that, Professor. Next. 
He also runs the Baltimore Limb Deformity course. He was the founder of this course, which started 29 years ago and still chairs and runs this course and uh, is the key member for this course. And this is a very popular course, uh, not only in the United States, but they get attendees from uh, all over the world. Next, but because of the current situation, the 30th course, which was supposed to be held in August, just in the uh, next month, uh, will not be possible because of the corona pandemic, we all know. So this time he's going to do a virtual course. And this is a two-day course, which I recommend all of you to attend. It's going to be a, a very, very interesting course. So he will tell us more about it uh, after his talk. Next. He recently was in uh, Pune. He visited Sanchetti Hospital with a photograph of his team and with uh, Professor K. Sanchetti. Next. Now it's my proud privilege to introduce to his, his colleague, uh, Michael Asayag. Michael Asayag also visited Pune. He's also an attendee at uh, the Rubin Institute for Advanced uh, Orthopedics in Sinai Hospital. He has a special interest in uh, adult limb lengthening and uh, correction of complex foot and ankle deformities. He also takes interest in musculoskeletal infections and osteomyelitis. Next. He's uh, uh, completed uh, his training in Quebec and uh, he has done the adult foot and ankle Lean Construction Fellowship at HSS in New York and also has uh, done a fellowship at the Rubin Institute. He is uh, also involved in a lot of uh, social work with uh, Professor Hilsenberg. Next. He again visited us when he was at the first uh, course uh, in deformity correction in Pune. Next. Uh, thanks, uh, Dr. Asayag. We also have the Indian faculty uh, who has joined us today. Dr. Milin Chaudhary from Akola is a very famous uh, deformity correction surgeon and does a lot of work in India for deformity correction. And along with him, Dr. Chetan Puram, who heads the deformity correction uh, department at Sanchati Hospital. So welcome to Dr. Milind and Hi. Dr. Chetan as well. Next. It's also my proud privilege to introduce to you uh, Dr. Neeraj Bijlani, who is with the Ortho TV team, and Dr. Shamshul Huda and Ashok Sham, and uh, my colleague, Dr. Sachin Tapaswi, who is uh, one of the founder members of uh, KEY, which is the Society of Knee Surgeons of India. So, welcome, uh, Dr. Sachin, Dr. Ashok, Dr. Neeraj, and Dr. Shamshul for this course. Next. So, with this small introduction, I just want to go through the agenda for today, the program. We'll have two talks. First talk is by Dr. Professor Herzenberg on principles and analysis of deformity correction in the lower limb. And the second talk will be by deformity correction planning. This is going to be a very unique talk, which is case-based by Dr. Michael Asad. And then we have case presentations by the Indian faculty, Dr. Milin, Dr. Chetan, and Dr. Sachin. And we'll have question answers right after each talk. So with this uh, short introduction, may I uh, hand over the proceedings to Professor John Herzenberg uh, to take over and uh, give us the first talk on basic principles and analysis of deformity correction. Over to Professor Herzenberg and thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. So he's just sharing his screen. He's sitting in his house today on a beautiful Saturday morning and speaking to us. Okay, so I hope you can uh, uh, see my screen. Is that visible? Not yet, not yet. You'll have to share it again. You'll have to. Oh, okay. okay, let's try that again. Yeah. Sorry about that. Um, so I hope you'll have to remove your screen first. Yeah. I want to share this. Yeah, now we can. Perfect. Now you can see it? Okay, good. Okay, can you see that okay? Super. Okay, great. Um, so thank you very much, uh, Professor Sanchetti, and to all my friends in India and who are listening in, uh, welcome. Uh, my talk will be on limb alignment and deformity assessment. And um, let me see, okay. These are my financial disclosures. And I'll just stop for a minute to recognize that this is a national holiday where I am here in, uh, in the United States, this is the 4th of July, which is uh, sometimes known as America's birthday. Uh, this is our uh, birth certificate. 
Um, it was the De Declaration of Independence in July 4th, 1776, which was written by Thomas Jefferson and others, and then signed by 56 gentlemen uh, in Philadelphia from all over the Eastern coast, all 13 colonies. Um, what does this document say? It's a very important document, but I'll just skip to the second paragraph because this is the most famous thing. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So we'll talk a little bit about this. Uh, these are our founding fathers. Uh, this is a depiction of the signing of the Declaration of Independence 244 years ago in Philadelphia at Independence Hall. And among the signers included uh, uh, future presidents, Thomas Jefferson and John Adams. Uh, interestingly, George Washington was not a signer. Uh, Benjamin Franklin, the famous scientist and publisher, was one of the signers. And there were also four physicians who signed the Declaration of Independence, the most famous of which is shown here uh, in the lower right. This is Dr. Benjamin Rush of uh, Philadelphia. But the most famous of the 56 signers of the Declaration of Independence, everyone I think would agree, was this man, John Hancock. And what made him famous, because uh, most people don't really know what he did or who he was, but he signed his name in very large letters, larger than anyone else. And the purpose of doing that, at least when they, they asked him, why did you sign your name so large? And he said, I did it so that King George would not have to put on his reading glasses to read my signature. And I think what we have to remember is that all 56 signers of the Declaration of Independence were basically signing their own death warrants because by signing this document, they announced that they were traitors to the crown and therefore they could be eligible to be captured and, and hung to death. So John Hancock was very brave and now in the English language, we sometimes use this as a phrase. We ask people to put your John Hancock here, meaning your signature. So that's the origin of that, um, that slang for a signature, John Hancock. But we do have a very troubled history in the United States. Um, our, our Declaration of Independence says that all men are created equal. But we know that um, that's not true, that George Washington owned over 300 slaves, the father of our country. Abraham Lincoln, who freed the slaves in a very difficult uh, war, the Civil War, which uh, killed hundreds of thousands of US uh, soldiers, brother against brother, uh, declared that all slaves should be freed. And that was 155 years ago. And yet, despite that, we still have problems. We've had uh, discrimination. We've had lynchings of black people. And even as recently as a month ago, uh, George Floyd was killed in daylight in front of people making videos by the police. So we have a long way to go. And even though we've had a uh, African-American as our president recently, we still are a work in progress. So that's the end of my history lesson. Uh, happy 4th of July uh, to everybody. Here's a couple of new citizens taking the oath of uh, citizenship. Thank you, that was very nice. I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Sanchetti for inviting me to India this past November. It was my first trip. I thoroughly enjoyed uh, my visit to India and to his home and meeting his uh, wife and children and his father and my many friends in India and um, also making new friends in India. This was uh, a wonderful experience for me. And I really enjoyed the culture of India. And these lovely ladies were out for uh, lunch together and they kindly agreed to let me photograph myself uh, with them. And we also got taken to uh, the Aga Khan castle and I got to see the father of your country, just like George Washington is the father of my country. I got to see a representation of Mahatma Gandhi. And I also immersed myself as much as I could in the culture of India. And at the conclusion of my trip, 
I spent a few days along with uh, Michael Asiag, my colleague, um, at an ashram uh, north of Mumbai, where I met um, this gentleman who is now, I'm happy to say, is my guru, um, Krishna Bhajan. And we still communicate on a regular basis, a very spiritual man. And so overall, I have to say my uh, visit to India was life changing. So thank you very much uh, for that, Parag. And I'll never forget that. It's our pleasure. Well, on to some orthopedics. Um, I'll be talking about limb alignment, deformity assessment, and how we make decisions. So there are some traditional teachings in orthopedics. Uh, one of them, if you look at the textbook, says that uh, if you have genuvarum, then you should do a high tibial osteotomy. And if you have genuvalgum, then you should do a distal femoral osteotomy. And this is maybe true in the 1950s and 60s, and this is a depiction of a U.S. classroom at that era. That's about the era that I was in school. But now the modern classroom, everybody has laptops, computers, and now we take a much more analytic approach. And that's what I'll be describing in this talk. So the old dictums of, of saying that genuvarum should be treated with a high tibial osteotomy and genuvalgum with a distal femoral osteotomy, this simply is not true anymore. This is what I call the cookie cutter approach. And um, since we're orthopedic surgeons, not cooks making cookies, we really shouldn't use the cookie cutter approach. We should take an analytic approach. So I propose um, this sequence, we call it MAP, measure the mechanical axis deviation, a is analyze the knee joint orientation. We measure the joint angles. And based on that, we P, pick the bone for osteotomy. So we call this the MAP test. Uh, and we apply it to every patient we see. So we start with the M, the mechanical axis deviation. Under ideal circumstances, if you draw a line from the hip to the ankle, that line should pass through the center of the knee. And thus your mechanical axis deviation is zero. This is desirable. The next step, the A, we draw in the joint orientation lines of the distal femur and proximal tibia. And then we draw a mechanical axis line that represents the femur. And the definition of a mechanical axis line is a line drawn from the center of the femoral head to the center of the knee for the femur and from the center of the knee to the center of the ankle for the tibia. And based on the angle that these lines form with the joint line, we can describe the joint orientation angle. And the normal angles of the distal femur laterally are between 85 and 90, and the proximal tibia medially also between 85 and 90. These are the normal ranges. Our options for treating patients with malalignment are tibial osteotomy, femoral osteotomy, and combined osteotomies. So we take this example of a uh, middle-aged man with a genoverm. Does he need a femoral osteotomy, a tibial osteotomy, or what? Well, first we can notice that he's lost some cartilage on the medial side. And if we measure the mechanical axis deviation, he's got medial mechanical axis deviation. And the close-up shows the mechanical axes of the femur and tibia and how they relate to the joint lines and we get angles of 90 degrees for the distal femur and 80 degrees for the tibia. Well, the 90 degrees is uh, within the normal range, 85 to 90, but 80 degrees for the tibia is not. It should also be 85 to 90. So based on this x-ray, we can P pick the tibia. And this is indeed what we did. We did a high tibial osteotomy. And this patient, this is him showing at 14 year follow-up with normal angles, and he's a little bit overcorrected, which was what we want to do to unweight the medial compartment. And it, patients like this can go for a long time before they need a total knee replacement. Professor Fujisawa from Japan described the concept of overcorrection into the lateral side to shift the mechanical axis laterally in order to unweight the medial plateau in cases where you have arthritis in the medial plateau. So in cases of pure deformity, we correct the bone to neutral, but in cases of uh, degenerative arthritis or medial compartment osteoarthritis, we overcorrect a small amount. And Fujisawa warned us never to go more than one third 
of the way from the center of the knee to the lateral edge of the knee. You should never push the axis further than that. Now, why is it that we push the axis laterally? Because even in a normal situation with the mechanical axis going through the center of the knee, we put 70% of our weight on the medial femoral condyle and only 30% on the lateral femoral condyle. So if our goal is to unweight the medial femoral condyle, we must do some degree of overcorrection. Now, the same is not true when you treat valgus deformities. You never overcorrect in varus. And why? Because the normal weight distribution is 70% medial and 30% lateral. So this is an example of um, a gentleman I saw some years ago who had a high tubular osteotomy to treat medial compartment osteoarthritis. And you can see he's had some ligament reconstructions, some ACL reconstructions, um, but this is what was done to him. And what's wrong here is that he was overcorrected. He was corrected so that his mechanical axis didn't just go to the Fujisawa point, but it went way over to the edge of the knee. And he was a very unhappy patient. The, uh, when we measured the angles, the lateral distal femoral angle measured 87 degrees, which is normal, but the medial proximal tibial angle measured 98. So he was uh, an unhappy patient and because they don't like this huge deformity of being overcorrected. So what was the treatment? The treatment was to revise the osteotomy, take out some of the correction, and the final result is shown on the far right side of the screen where his mechanical axis line passes through the Fujisawa point, not through the center of the knee because he has some medial compartment arthritis. So we wanna unload that a little bit, but certainly not as far laterally as he was when he first came to see me. Here's another case, uh, a 16 year old boy who has genuverum and he has a leg length discrepancy. Now his history was that of trauma to the distal femoral growth plate and he presents with this deformity. And when we do the MAP test, we start by measuring the mechanical axis deviation. We can see that he's got some medial mechanical axis deviation on his normal left side, but the right side has almost three centimeters of medial mechanical axis deviation. Now, is this coming from the femur or the tibia? That's where we now need to analyze the joint angles. But according to the the common dictums of orthopedics for uh, varus, you should do a high tibial osteotomy. Does that make sense for this patient? So if we measure the angles and we draw in the individual mechanical axes of the bone from the femur to the knee, from the knee to the ankle, and measure how, that re how those mechanical axes relate to the joint orientation lines, we can see that he has 85 degree medial proximal tibial angles on both sides. So that's within the normal range, normal is 85 to 90, but his lateral distal femoral angle on the right side is 94 degrees. So therefore the source of his varus, the source of his medial mechanical axis deviation is genuverum. It's not coming from the tibia so much, it's coming primarily from the femur because the femur normal angle should be between 85 and 90. Now, looking at his normal side, we can see that there's a slight mismatch between the tibial and femoral angles. Ideally, those two numbers should be the same. It should be 89-89 or 85-85, but we have a little bit of a mismatch, a little bit more varus in the femur, but not enough to cause him some problems. And so his left side, we can say, is within normal range, but the right side is certainly not. So... This patient needs, even though he has genuverum, he needs a femoral osteotomy to correct his LDFA of 94 to try to get it to match the uh, ipsilateral MPTA of 85 degrees. Another case is this uh, adult male who has a history of Ollier disease. And as a result, his left side has this obvious varus malalignment, this genuverum, and he has knee pain. So how do we analyze him? How do we apply the MAP test? Well, we start by drawing the mechanical axis line from the hip to the ankle. That's the overall mechanical axis of the entire limb. And on his normal side, he's within the normal limits. He goes through the center of the knee, but on the ipsilateral left side, he's got a whopping seven centimeters of medial mechanical axis deviation. So it's not hard to understand how he would develop medial compartment arthritis and pain but we have to prove where it's coming from. The 
standard dictums of orthopedics would say if you have genu varus, you should do a high tibial osteotomy. Genu valgum, you should do a distal femoral osteotomy. Does that apply to this case? Well, let's do the analysis. We'll start by doing the analyze the joint angles part of the test where we draw the mechanical axes of the femur from the hip to the knee and the mechanical axis line of the tibia from the knee to the ankle, and then measure how those lines intersect with the joint orientation line. And when we do the numbers, the tibia measures 94 degrees, which is actually a little bit of valgus. A normal tibia is between 85 and 90. And indeed on his normal right side, he has an 89 degree medial proximal tibial angle. But the medial proximal tibial angle on the involved left side is overcorrected into a bit of uh, valgus, maybe compensating for the severe varus that he has in the, in the femur. And his uh, lateral distal femoral angle measuring the orientation of the femur is uh, a, a whopping 115 degrees. Again, normal should be between 85 and 90. So I think it's pretty clear that the majority of the problem here is coming from the femur, there's some compensation in the tibia. So how would you approach this? How would you pick the bone to treat? Should you treat uh, the femur and the tibia or is it enough just to do the femur? And I would argue that here, um, it's enough to do the femur, do an osteotomy so that the LDFA becomes 94 degrees to match what you have in the tibia. And that I believe would be a safe uh, correction. So this primarily is coming from the femur, and there is some overcorrection of the tibia, but enough that I think is uh, okay to leave. And it raises this concept of what we call the good combination and bad combination. So in this little diagram that you're seeing on the bottom, uh, the, part, the, the picture that's listed as normal shows the 87 degrees and 87 degrees. The numbers match, the mechanical axis line falls through the middle of the knee. Uh, the good combination would be a little bit of overcorrection into varus and the femur and a little bit of overcorrection into valgus and the tibia. So for example, the good combo here is shown 95 degree LDFA and 95 degree MPTA. Now, why is that a good combination? Because the adductor moment would here cause some compression of the cartilage, whereas in the far right diagram, the bad combination, the adductor moment causes shear of the cartilage and, and the femur slides down that slope of the, of the tibia, which, and then shear leads to arthritis. So the bad combination would be the opposite, would be valgus in the distal femur and varus in the proximal tibia. So for example, in this patient, we wouldn't wanna do a tibial osteotomy and create 115 degree um, deformity. That would be um, a little bit crazy to go that far. But we can do an osteotomy of the distal femur and create a 94 degree femur that will match. And that will be our, our good combination. But you know, I think there's a limit to everything. And um, 94, 95 is about the limit that I go on a tibia for this type of situation. Beyond that, uh, I think you can have too good of a combination. So I wouldn't, for example, recommend 100-100 uh, as a combination. But uh, 85 to 90, 95 degrees, I think is satisfactory. So that's the combination of the, the concept of good combination, bad combination. Uh, let's look at this patient. This is a 31 year old male who's got left knee pain. Uh, he looks like he's in some valgus and indeed he does have some medial, some lateral mechanical axis deviation on his left side. Uh, based on the, on the old principles, you would uh, do a uh, distal femoral osteotomy for genovalgum, but does it make sense here? Let's ask the question. So if you do the analysis, the analyze test, the analyze the joint angles, we draw a line from the hip to the knee, from the knee to the ankle, and we see what the intersection is with the joint lines. And here we get an LDFA of 85 degrees and an MPTA of 90. So what about those numbers? Well, the LDFA of 85 is borderline valgus. 85 the normal is, is uh, 85 to 90 is normal, but 85 is on the valgus end of normal. And on the tibia, we have an MPTA of 90. So what about that? Well, 85 to 90 is normal. So technically he's normal in both, both measurements. And yet he's on the high end of normal uh, tending towards the valgus side in the femur and the high end of normal tending towards the valgus side in the tibia. So this combination of borderline valgus in the femur and borderline valgus in the tibia 
is additive and it's what's creating the overall valgus. So he has a combination of femoral valgus and tibial valgus. So based on this, how do we decide which bone to pick? What, uh, what's gonna be our, our solution? Well, based on the discussion I just gave you before about the uh, good combination, bad combination, I would say that um, maybe it's best to leave the, accept the valgus uh, tibia and create a varus femur. So my solution here would be to um, do a femoral osteotomy and create the so-called good combination of varus femur and valgus tibia. And this last example I'll show you, or second to last, is a 42-year-old male with painful knees, overall uh, valgus orientation. Clearly uh, valgus overall, but where is it coming from? If we draw the, if we do the map test and draw the uh, joint orientation lines and the individual mechanical axes of the femur and tibia, we can see that the femurs have normal numbers, 87 and 88 degrees, but the tibia has 93 degrees and 95 degrees. So the valgus is uh, coming from the tibia. So even though the standard orthopedic teaching would say for genu valgum, you should do a, high tibia, a distal femoral osteotomy, our recommendation here is to operate on the tibia. So I'll take it the next step further and Michael will get into this in greater detail. But if we accept the femur as uh, good, we can uh, just simply continue the femoral line down and that represents the mechanical axis of the proximal tibia. And then we can draw planning lines to represent the shaft of the tibia. And we get an intersection in the metadaxial junction measuring 10 degrees. This tells us the osteotomy that we need to do and where to do it. So this is beyond the map test into what we call the ABCs, apex bone cut correction. And we draw the bone cut at the uh, apex of the deformity and do the correction. And this is what we can expect. And in this case, that's indeed what we did. We did the right side first a metadaxial acute correction of the, of the tibia. We call it fixator assisted uh, nailing. We used a fixator temporarily to get the correction and a nail to maintain it. And then we went back six months later and did the left side. So that's a demonstration of uh, principles of deformity correction. And just to show you um, a little bit of an odd case, let's look at this one. This is the last case I'll show you. And this is a, um, a young man uh, 25 years old, who when he was a teenager had a fracture around the knee. He's had a patella fracture, you can see by the fixation. And what's going on here? So if we do the analysis, he's overall in valgus with um, a five centimeters of lateral mechanical axis deviation. So based on that, should we do a distal femoral osteotomy? Well, before we make that decision, let's uh, do the analysis. If we draw the individual mechanical axes, we can see that he has a 64 degree LDFA, that's way valgus, that's humongous valgus, and the MPTA of 76, and normal again is 80, 85 to 90. So he's got significant valgus in the femur and significant varus in the tibia, so a combination. So in a case like this where neither one of these numbers is acceptable, we have no choice but to do an osteotomy of both. So based on this um, analysis, we would say this patient needs uh, a osteotomy above and below the knee to correct it. And uh, this shows you the analysis of just correcting the femur and then the tibia. And what we actually did is we did a distal femoral osteotomy with gradual correction. The purpose of this was also to gain some length because he had growth arrest related to the initial injury. And so we gained length not only in the distal femur but also the proximal tibia and ended up with an overall uh, nicely corrected mechanical axis. So should you do femur, tibia, or both? What I propose to you, ladies and gentlemen, is to use an analytic approach to osteotomies about the knee, not the cookie cutter approach of always doing a distal femoral osteotomy for genu valgum and a proximal tibial osteotomy for genu verum. We're not cookie cutters. And lastly, I'm gonna end my talk just by taking a moment to invite you all to uh, consider coming to join us at the end of August. Uh, we're having our 30th annual Baltimore Limb Deformity course. Uh, due to the uh, COVID pandemic, we've gone virtual. So we've done a huge amount of work to take all of our talks and put them on uh, pre-recorded, um, uh, available for downstreaming, um, live streaming and, and uh, streaming on demand um, 
uh, all the topics that we're going to be talking about. We're also going to have some live uh, virtual sessions. And um, uh, I hope that some of you will consider joining us in the end of August. This, this, this streaming content will be available for a few months online. The, there'll also be some live sessions on the 29th to the 30th where we can do case discussions and questions and answers. So um, thank you very much um, to the Society for Knee Surgery in India, for Ortho TV, for inviting myself and Dr. Asiag. And with that, I will conclude my talk. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Herzenberg. That was uh, a fantastic talk. Always learn more tips when I listen to your talks again. And um, I think we'll open this uh, uh, first paper for discussion. So if there are any questions amongst the panelists, we'll be very happy to take them. Also, in the meantime, uh, Dr. Ashok Sham can collate all the questions that have come from the YouTube link as well, and then share it over to us. I'm going to ask my first question to you, uh, Professor Herzenberg. I think in the very first example that you shared, where we had, uh, where you demonstrated a patient who had an overcorrection or an overcorrected heart tubal osteotomy with the weight bearing line actually passing way beyond on the lateral tibial spine. And then you had to do a recorrection and do a, a osteotomy on his lateral tibia. I also noticed that there was a screw that was put on the inferior tibiofibular point or just above in the supramedular area. I mean, could you highlight what that was for and uh, what was the purpose of doing that as well? Yeah. Um so I think that might have been from where he had an external fixator, and we wanted to make sure that uh, we want we wanted to prevent any uh, correction uh, or disruption of the distal mortis, and so we put a temporary stabilizing screw to prevent disruption of the mortis during the correction. So in this operation, we do uh, a fixator-assisted nailing. What that means is we temporarily apply a fixator-assisted plating. I'm sorry, we temporarily applied an external fixator. Uh, to his leg, cut the bone, straightened it, got re uh, repeat x-rays, check the mechanical axis alignment. And once we're satisfied with the alignment, that's when we put on the, the locking plate. At that point, we take off the fixator. But the purpose there was to prevent the, um, t the fibula from riding up proximally because of the extreme tension that was applied to the, um, to the um, tibia. Now, you might say, why not just cut the tibia? In his case, uh, he had a stretch of the lateral collateral ligament from his long-standing genu verum, and we wanted to make sure that the lateral collateral ligament got pulled down a little bit by the osteotomy, and so hence we uh, left the screw in for about six months. Okay, another question that I have is that, um, you know, it's a very basic question that uh, we all get asked quite often, that we plan for an osteotomy on our drawing board or on the trauma CAD or you know, we use your uh, uh, Bone Ninja app quite frequently. And then once we've used that, we have sort of planned for maybe a six degree opening on the tibia or on the femur. Once we've done that, intraoperatively, we cannot mimic the joint loading conditions, you know. So when we do a scanogram film or a long leg film, we have the natural body loading on it. That's one. Second, when we go in the OR, the probably the best that we can achieve is to give axial pressure on the heel and try and mimic natural loading, but it's never the same. So what do we trust? Should we trust our intraoperative alignment films or, or our fluoroscopy intraoperatively? Or should we go ahead with the preoperative plan that we have exactly get those same angles or the same amount of correction one more time? And once we've achieved that kind of um, intraoperative opening, do we stick with that even if our intraop fluoroscopy shows something else? Well, that's a very interesting question and a real challenging problem. Uh, and I think it relates to the fact that many of these patients have some degree of collateral ligament instability. So how they are gonna be positioned depends if you're loading them in varus or valgus or neutral. And uh, so some of that involves a judgment. Some of that maybe involve a addressing the problem. So if you indeed have significant lateral collateral ligament laxity, either MCL or LCL, then that probably should be addressed in addition to addressing the skeletal deformity. Um, but I tend to do what you described, where, where we load it interoperatively. And um, you have to recognize though, that if there is some sloppiness in the knee that you're never gonna get it perfect. 
Um, you just have to make sure you do the best you can. And uh, what I like to do, I like to say to my uh, trainees is that in orthopedics, we, we measure with a micrometer, we mark with chalk, and we cut with an ax. So every step of the way, you're losing some degree of your um, accuracy. We can measure very carefully on an x-ray. We can uh, mark it with a crayon. But then when we cut it with a saw and move it and try to fix it, um, all bets are off. So the, the solution that we've come up with in our practice is to apply a temporary external fixator. That gives you a chance to test drive the correction. So you get whatever correction you think you need, and then you can load it. You can x-ray it. You can check the mechanical axis by taking a, a, a bovi cord, a, a quadri cord from the hip to the ankle. Uh, and, and load it in different positions and decide what works best. And once you're happy with uh, the correction you think is going to work best for that patient, that's when you put on your locking plate or your nail and then take off the fixator. So I call it try before you buy. Um, put on a fixator, get a good correction, adjust it, tweak it until you're happy uh, under various loading conditions or however you can mimic uh, the weight bearing situation. And then uh, you're doing it hopefully in a way that will mimic uh, what the patient sees when they stand up. So when you're using this fixator plate system, so if I want to use a locking plate along with an X fix, which I want to try and buy, then one of the problems or one of the concerns which I'd like you to highlight is that where do you place the pins of your X fix? So if I'm doing, if I'm going to plate it from the medial side of the tibia, do I have my pins coming from medial to lateral or do I have them coming from lateral to medial? From medial to lateral would be, you know, really more scientific and more biomechanical. So in this small space of say, if you're doing a high tibial osteotomy, you have a small space, you know, in the proximal fragment, how do you compromise or how do you place your pin for your X fix so that it does not compromise the fixation of your locking plate? Uh, good question. So uh, in the case example that you're, you're talking about, a high tibial osteotomy for uh, genuverum, um, you can place the fixator either laterally or medially. If you're going from varus to valgus, it makes more sense to me to put it on the lateral side. Uh, proximally, you can put the pin just subchondral, and we use a six millimeter pin. I put in a wire first, then ream over it with a cannulated drill bit, and then put in a six millimeter pin. Distally, you have to be a little bit careful about the soft tissues. Um, and so if I'm putting a distal pin from the lateral side, uh, I'll very carefully spread with a hemostat and then use uh, drill guides and pin guides so that we don't wrap up the soft tissues. If you decide, if you're going from valgus to varus and you're gonna put the plate on the uh, lateral side, then you can put your fixator on the medial side. It's the same thing in the distal femur. So very common operation for us. And I think Michael will show you examples is a distal femoral valgus where we put a fixator on the medial side of the femur and uh, you're, you're fairly low, you're away from the neurovascular bundle and um, you, uh, you sometimes reach a situation where some of your pins, one in the proximal, one of your screws rather, in the proximal end of the plate or one or two in the distal end of the plate would be very close to your X fix. So the concept is to put as many pins, as many screws as you can and once you uh, have some stability, then at that point you can take off your fixator and put in the remaining pins that would uh, interfere. Now where it gets a little bit tricky is if you have a biplanar uh, deformity and you have to put on a biplanar fixator. So now you've got a pin on the proximal end of the tibia, one on the lower end of the tibia, and then one anteriorly proximal and distal. Um, and so uh, these are all very doable, and the more experience you get with them, you kind of learn the tricks. But if you keep your pins uh, high, close to the joint, and distal beyond where the plate's going to be, you, you can usually uh, do it quite satisfactorily. Um, Prof, there's a question that's come up uh, on the chat box here. It comes from Dr. Amit Chandratne, who's uh, calling in from UK. And his question is that, what is your take on patient-specific jigs for achieving correct correction. What's your take on that? Right. So that's an interesting concept uh, that's been um, explored by various groups where you, uh, get a, you get a CT scan of the limb, you send it off to a company, they do the analysis for you, and then they build a jig and they use, you apply the jig uh, according to their instructions, and you make perfect saw cuts, 
and that should close down and allow you to do a corrective osteotomy. Well, I, I, I like the concept, um, but in reality, it's expensive, it's a lot of work, and you know, I, I think in the end, we have to recognize we're surgeons, and we're not computers, and we shouldn't abrogate our surgical responsibility to a computer to do the a correction for us. Um, so I, I, I like it as a proof of concept. I, I think it's a nice idea, but I think um, it's not super practical, uh, especially in the developing world where uh, financial constraints are, are considerable. And so while I, I laud the uh, approach and the, uh, the scholarly activity that's been done in that direction, I don't use it personally in my practice. Thank you. Thanks so much. Michael, you have a comment to make? I can see you. Oh, you have to unmute yourself, Michael. Thanks. There you go. Well, I think uh, in a few minutes, we're going to go over, uh, we're going to bump up a little bit the complexity of the cases uh, and by applying the same method. And we'll see how this method applied by the best in the field in the world, who still go step by step, despite their 30 years, 25 years of experience, we can see how it can get us from complex problems with different variables to good results or hopefully good results. Uh, Chetan, you have a question, I think. Uh, can you come yeah, in? I wanted to ask uh, Professor uh, that you mentioned about a good combination and a bad combination. So are there any uh, specific criteria that help you decide which is a good combination and which is a bad combination? So the, in the, around the knee, the good combination is varus femur valgus tibia. The bad combination is uh, valgus femur varus tibia. So what it amounts to is the slope of the knee joint. So if this is the knee joint, this kind of slope is good. This kind of slope is bad. Why is this bad? Because the femoral condyles will slide down this slope. If you're sloped upwards, I mean, there's a limit. You can't have crazy slopes. But if you're a little bit sloped upwards, then the femoral condyle doesn't slide. It impacts against the uh, cartilage of the tibia uh, under the adductor moment. So uh, bad, good. This is how I remember it. Good combination, bad combination. Within okay. limits. Yeah, so right. I think uh, Milind has a question. We'll ask Milind for the last question, and yes. then we'll uh, move to Michael. Question to John, please. Of course, uh, using the fixator allows us the freedom to control. Uh, I wanted to ask you the question about the TSF fixator intraoperative. It's difficult to get a fluoroscopic view of the TSF fixator, the entire width of the limb of the ring, to be able to measure the center of the ring and be able to run the program uh, when you use the TS and not the simple Elisa as fixator or fixator plating or nailing. How do you overcome the technical challenge of using the TS in the OR? Okay, uh, Milan, let me make sure I'm getting listening to you correctly or hearing you correctly that uh, you're asking about the TSF, Taylor Spatial Frame Fixator? Yes. Yes, okay. please. Okay, so there is a concept uh, that proposed by Roger uh, Atkins from, uh, from Bristol in the UK. He calls it chaos, you know, computerized hexapod adjustment orthopedic yes. surgery. Yes, we read the paper, yes. Chaos. Uh, so he applies a, uh, a hexapod style fixator, the TSF, or one of any number of fixators that are available now, and, uh, and does the correction with that. And then he usually uses a nail or a plate to, for the definitive fixation. I, I think that that's, um, it's interesting and in his hands it works, but I, I, my reservations about it echo yours, that it's bulky, it gets in the way of the x-rays, the leg is now lifted off the table, so the hip is flexed, the knee is flexed, and so I prefer a monolateral fixator. If it's a pure uh, frontal plane deformity, it's, it's enough to put one pin above, one pin below. If it's a oblique plane deformity or a sagittal plane deformity, then you have to have a, a sagittal plane fixator going from front to back. Okay. But I can handle anything with four pins and two bars. And if you're putting in a nail, you have to be really careful not to block the passage of your nail. Right. But if you're putting it in a plate, it's usually not that hard to avoid it. And I get good x-rays because I'm only having um, you know, two pins in a single bar in the front and two pins in a single bar on the side. So I don't like the chaos method. To me, that's chaotic. Um, I like um, simple fixators. Okay. Thank you. 
Thank you, thank you, um, you know, Professor Erzenberg, uh, for this fantastic, uh, you know, opening talk. And we've got questions pouring in. We'll take them towards the end. And at this juncture, I'd like to invite you, Michael, to um, please share your screen and start with your presentation. We'll look at more complex deformities, of course, with the best learning example, which is a case-based session. Over to you, Michael. Screen is all of yours to share. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Sachin. And I have to admit that when Dr. Parag and Dr. Ashok reached out to me, I accepted the invitation with alacrity. Uh, I was very happy to uh, to join you and, and to share a little bit of, of my small experience in company of Dr. Hertzenberg here. So without waiting any further, uh, good evening to all our friends for, and, and colleagues who are in India. Good morning to everyone who's in America and everywhere in between. So today we're going to apply that same method as I was mentioning earlier uh, to a different area of cases. And we'll just review the nomenclature very quickly. All these acronyms, you should snap a picture of this image and learn these angles by heart. Um, in, a, in a nutshell, the first letter, the M or the A, means mechanical versus anatomic. The second letter is either lateral or medial. The third letter, proximal or distal. The fourth letter, femur or tibia. And the last letter is always angle. So those acronyms are not that complicated. There's only two options for each, each side. There are normal values both for the coronal plane and there are also normal values in the sagittal plane, whereas we're not going to go further in, much into detail um, into the, the intricacies of the sagittal plane today, but you also have to take into consideration the plane of motion of the joint. And that's where careful planning, careful uh, um, x-ray measurements are, are really mandatory and primordial, should I say. So let's start with this uh, case who is a 38-year-old male with a history of neglected adolescent blount. Uh, he had a long-standing history of bilateral medial knee pain, but also a very severe knee flexion deformity that was uh, crippling him, that was preventing him from, from walking properly. This is a case seen in the uh, United States, but you, you can have the same case presenting in any country in this world. So the first step, we map the ABC. It's always the same thing. And I'll repeat this. I've trained with some of the best surgeons in the, in the world in this field. And despite 20 or 30 years of practice, they still apply these steps religiously. So we draw the mechanical axis by drawing a line that goes from the center of the hip to the center of the ankle. And we measure the distance between the, uh, the center of the knee and that line. And what we can, uh, what we can, conclude is that this patient has severe bilateral genuvarum. He also has bilateral joint instability as depicted by the subluxation, the opening of, of the knee joints, but he also has knee flexion deformities. And knee flexion deformities will prevent this patient from fully extending his leg, from locking his extensor mechanism. And basically when he stands or walks, relying on the, on the bony stability, it's very tiring for a patient. Um, so once that we have that information, we have to analyze the joint orientation angles. Where does that deformity come from? Well, in this case, it comes from a little bit everywhere, right? But the worst offender are the tibias as depicted by the very low MPTA, so medial proximal tibial angles, which are respectively 66 and uh, the other side was similar. And the PPTA, the posterior uh, proximal tibial angle, which is 49 degrees. So although the femur also has a mild deformity, the, um, and the second angle here where it says LDFA 93 should actually read uh, PDFA 83. So we pick the bone, the tibia should be corrected. And in this case, well, we could actually opt for a good combo because uh, the main offender is the tibia and the, the femur has a very mild deformity that we could accept and just create mild joint obliquity that, that wouldn't cause any shearing forces. 
Now, what really is important here is to take into account, as Dr. Sachin has said earlier, the, uh, the joint laxity. And the truth is, when you correct these, these deformities gradually with an external fixator, whether you use a classic Elizarov or a computerized hexapod, you have the luxury to um, get the patient to stand when the correction is almost over and see what the, what the uh, physiological loads create. And no one here in the right mind could, could consider an acute correction because the, the stress on the, uh, the stress on the soft tissue structures would be so great that it would require a lot of shortening of the bone with the associated muscle weakness. So now that we know who's the offender, which bone to pick, we have to analyze the deformity and find the apex. Where is that deformity located? So there's a few strategies that can be used, but here the goal is always to realign hip, knee, and ankle. And if in the end we want this to be collinear, it all comes down to finding in these single level deformities, finding a proximal axis, finding a distal axis, and figuring out where they intersect. In this case, we know that we are, we, uh, we are not going to change the mechanical axis of the femur. So we could use that proximal mechanical axis and subtend it and, and extend it distally towards the knee and use that as our proximal, desired proximal mechanical axis. For the distal mechanical axis, there's multiple options, but we can either use the long diathesis or we can create a normal angle at the ankle. Here, we decided to use a, a, a long segment of diathesis. Now, you can't see it, but the next step is to pick the bone cut. And the bone cut has to be done in an area where it's anatomically feasible. You want to do the, the, the bone cut as well in an area where bone is healthy. Professor Elizarov has described to us that uh, to correct the deformity, we need biology and we need stability. And, and bone that has never been broken, bone that has never been operated on has the best biology. So we pick the bone cut in a feasible area where the skin can tolerate it, where the bone can tolerate it. And then we find the correction axis. And the correction axis is established by drawing a bisector, by separating that obtuse angle, that wider angle, if you can see my mouse, into two equal angles. And wherever that line lays should lay the hinge. For those of you who use Elizabeth, um, classic Elizabeth fixators, it means that the hinge should be somewhere on that line. And if you analyze this deformity, it's actually not both, it's not two deformities, right? It's an oblique plane deformity in one area that is about the same in the tibia. So you have to figure out how to find that oblique plane deformity. If you wanna know more about how to do that, you sign up to the Baltimore Limb Deformity course this year and, and this will be one of, the, uh, one of the top lectures. So we correct the axis and we end up with this planning, this correction. What does it look like clinically? Well, clinically, when we perform this case, we realize that the, now the mechanical axis is straight. The MPTA, the PPTAs are normalized. There's a strong column of bone, but not only that, but the knee joint, although abnormal, has still normalized. It's not as sublux, it's not as, ga as gaped open. But what we can see is that the planning matches almost to the to the dot, almost to the uh, to the T, the, um, the the correction obtained. So this is how you use this method to find the apex and to find the good correction. Now let's do, j jump do, delve a little bit further into a more complex case. Uh, another 38 year old, but female this time. She has spina bifida occulta, and she's an active woman. She has no neurological symptoms. However, her spina bifida occulta can uh, manifest itself in her joint. And she has mostly right lateral knee pain, bilateral genu valgum deformity, but the right being slightly more than the left. And, and on clinical examination, she has a lot of various valgus instability. How do we tackle such a problem? Well, we map the ABC. So the first thing is that we draw the mechanical axis deviation 
and the, we, we confirm that the right side and the left side are invalgous, the right being worse than the left. Now she also has a subluxation of the joint as depicted by the JCA. JCA means joint congruence angle. And it's basically the angle between the articular surfaces of the femur and the tibia. And here it's about five degrees, but remember your physical examination is, is key where it shows you that that five degrees is unstable. So once the mechanical axis is realigned, you don't really know where it's going to lay. So here the offender is the tibia at 92 degrees, but it's also the joint. So there's multiple options in this case. You could create a, a deformity correction that, def that corrects everything through an intraarticular correction through a total knee replacement. That's a good option, right? However, this is a young patient. She's 38 years old. She's active. She wants to run. So total knee replacements that are a piece of mechanics have a lifespan. They're not, they're not good for everyone. Could we do just a tibial osteotomy? Well, we know that the, re the main offender is the tibia, so we could. Could we do both at the osteotomies? Or can we just send that patient away to your colleague or your worst enemy because you want to avoid the headache? Well, I never shy away from a good fight. And I like to restore anatomy rather than replace joints in a young patient at least. Uh, but correcting that whole deformity through the tibia, which means that you need to correct the joint deformity and the tibia deformity would mean severe correction. So we opted for a double level correction. So I picked option number three. So now if we want to have to find the apex, we actually have to find two APCs, one at the femur and one at the tibia. And to do that, we still have to find a proximal axis of the femur, a distal axis of the femur, a proximal axis of the tibia, and a distal axis of the tibia. So how do we do this? Well, there is a three-line method that can be used to find the desired proximal mechanical axis of the femur that, that I did not fully include in this talk. But once again, you can come to the Baltimore Limb Deformity course and, uh, and learn a little bit more about it. But there is a very clear method to find that proximal mechanical axis. Distally, I decided that I wanted to get a 90 degree LDFA. So I drew a 90 degree LDFA. And the area where that, those two axes um, uh, intersected is called the apex. And that's where the deformity in the femur lays. For the tibia, I did the same method. However, I used a normal MPT of 87. I decided to undercorrect a little bit to compensate for those five degrees of joint laxity. If I bring the MPT to 90 degrees, as well as the femur to 90 degrees, there's a high likelihood that when the mechanical axis realigns, then I get a big correction of about five degrees that will overcorrect. For the distal tibial axis, I chose a bisector. Now, if we do the correction, here I didn't do the, 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 the um, osteotomy the same way that the Paley principles explained to us, but I used a modified Rosbrook method uh, that is beyond the scope of this talk. However, once the correction is realigned, when, that, when, I, when, I re, when I realign all those axes, I end up with a normal mechanical axis, a mechanical axis deviation that is zero. Now let's see about the bone cut and the correction. Well, intraoperatively, this case went well, but not without complication. Now we can notice that there's a mild discrepancy between the planning and the execution. Whereas the mechanical axis overcorrected a little bit, despite the fact that I undercorrected the tibia. So to answer the, the, the uh, Dr. Sachin's question, intraoperatively, before I, I commit to these osteotomies, I thoroughly stressed the joint to look at what would happen if the correction was fully corrected. If the joint was fully reduced, what would happen to the mechanical axis? And then I tried to impart a little bit of weight bearing. However, we know that I, I can't create, I'm not strong enough to create 200 pounds or 150 pounds of, of weight bearing. So the answer needs to lay somewhere in the middle. If you want to avoid these issues, 
you need to do a gradual correction of the tibia. You can do an acute correction of the femur, but you, you, want, you need to do a gradual correction of the tibia, stand the patient and, and, and see under physiological load what happens. This third patient, he is a 53 year old male, had an accident in the past and has a 30 years history of genuverum and medial sign knee pain. And initially he was sent to an, another colleague for a knee replacement, but uh, sent to me after that for a second opinion. Young guy uh, wants to be active, he's a farmer and he crouches a lot, very active, very strong, had a little bit of medial side knee pain. Map the ABC always, map the APC all day, every day. So we draw the mechanical axis, we diagnose genuvarum and procurvatum, and the mechanical axis is posterior to the hinge point of the knee. The hinge point of the knee is the intersection between the posterior cortex and Blumensat line. And in the best of worlds, you want that mechanical axis to be in front, right in front of that hinge point contained into the, the bone. We analyze the joint orientation angles and the femur is to blame for this deformity. So for the first case that we saw, the tibia was to blame for the deformity. In this situation, the femur is to blame. So when I was trained not so long ago, not in the 50s, when I was trained in the, uh, in the year 2000s, we still used the dogma, varus tibia valgus femur, varus valgus, and then we just, we would remember that. It's not true. Use the analytic method, map the ABC all the time. Which bone we picked in this case? Well, we don't pick the tibia, even if it's a varus deformity or an oblique plane deformity. We pick, we go where the money is, like they say in, in, in the US. So um, you correct the femur. We use the same method, the three line method proximally to find the desired proximal mechanical axis. And distally, distally I use the tibia mechanical axis that because I know that I'm not going to correct the tibia. So the goal is to realign hip, knee, and tibia, and, and ankle without touching the tibia. So I might as well use the mechanical axis of the tibia. Here, if you notice, the astute eye will notice that I did not bring the mechanical axis at the center of the joint, but at the lateral tibial spine. And this is to compensate and, and offload a little bit the medial compartment. Because I want to decrease the um, the joint reactive forces that will that will cause this patient's pain. But, so we have an oblique plane deformity, 28 degrees in the uh, coronal plane, 15 degrees in the sagittal plane, which means the apex is actually anterolateral, somewhere anterolateral. If you use a gradual correction to correct this this deformity, you want to make sure that the hinge is located accurately at the right um, angle anterolaterally. So we do the bone cut in an area where it's feasible. So above that callus and we establish a correction. But if you do an acute correction, you have to establish that correction. And, and if the bone cut is away from the apex of the joint, some translation, uh, uh, the apex of the deformity, some translation will have to be uh, imparted. So we look at the planning, we look at the execution. In this case, we used a fixer assisted method, fixer assisted nailing, and we inserted the nail very accurately with blocking screws to prevent any movement at the osteotomy site. This patient was successful in avoiding uh, the knee replacement for now, and he's happy, he has no more pain, he's back on his farm. And, uh, and hopefully for many years. Now we'll venture a little bit away because I want to take, we want to take time for questions and, uh, but we'll see how this reconstruction method and this access method and external fixation method can help us as well, not only correct uh, lower extremities, but also upper extremities. Uh, so this is a 42 year old, uh, very nice gentleman who uh, sustained a low velocity, so pistol gunshot at the left upper extremity. 
was treated conservatively, unfortunately sent to jail um, and lost the follow-up. But if he showed up six months later with this image, a very hypertrophic non-union uh, with a lot of atrophy on the lateral side and a lot of missile fragments. He was treated in another institution and it was treated, one could argue, improperly uh, without compression, without stable fixation. And what had, what had to happen happened. He uh, developed a fistula drainage and didn't undergo surgical treatment for his osteomyelitis. 19, it was still lost to follow up, went back to jail and came back 19 months later with this failure of his hardware, another hypertrophic non-union. But this time, a high likelihood of infection because this patient has a big phlegma and a lot of pain and on and off drainage from the sur surgical incision. So we have to go through a different kind of method here. We don't necessarily map the ABC, but you have to go through a, a, a systematic approach to dealing with non-unions, especially non infected non-unions. Interestingly, this uh, patient has a very nice tattoo that you can look in both directions. On one direction, it looks like life, and the other direction looks like death. And um, this really summarizes, unfortunately, a lot of the ethos of some of our patients um, due to social, social inequalities. So what's the plan here? Well, first we wanna establish the causes of the non-union, right? We wanna establish uh, the uh, presence or the absence of infection. We get a sedimentation rate and we get a C-reactive protein, but we also wanna dose the vitamin D levels. Is this patient, uh, is this patient um, vitamin D deficient? Can we optimize him? And we have to come up with a thorough plan, remove the hardware, assess the bones, obtain cultures, do a thorough debridement. And here we have multiple cho choices, but we want to do a stable construct with, uh, with compression. So long plating or long external fixation with compression. Uh, the dispersion will require long-term IV antibiotics and maybe even suppressive antibiotics um, until the bone is fully healed and there's no more hardware. So those are the intraoperative picture after the plates were removed after the, um, the bone was debrided and then the bone on the left look like, looks like a pterodactyl and the bone on the right looks like a T-bone or a wishbone. And how do you plate this? How do you nail this? How do you, how do you obtain stable compression? So although even if you go in with a plan of doing long compression plating, you have to have multiple plans in your mind and realign the axes, the diaphysis axes. So here we opted for a circular axonal fixopod, um, just because that's what I'm familiar with, but an Elizarov, classic Elizarov could have been very sufficient. Why did I opt for uh, an Elizarov? Well, it's to realign that red marrow. To, and, and I took notes of where that red marrow is anatomically, and I tried to realign it on X-ray. Got some cultures, was positive for, for uh, MRSA, methicillin resistant Staph aureus, and left some local antibiotics. So immediate post-op, this is what the construct looks, looks like. You notice there's a very wide spread between the pins. There's a very short working distance between my two pins. And you can actually see that there is good compression, that, that inferior pin and that superior pin, they're bending. There is compression input into that system. So compression, long fixation, no bone graft here because it's a hypertrophic non-union. So the, the potential, the biology potential is there and it's an infected environment. If we neutralize the infection, we can always go back if, if it fails to heal. Three months later, there's callus formation, although it's strange because we had we did compression. So this may not be as uh, absolute stability as we think and frame removal after six months, the bone is fully healed. The, the external fixer was removed. Notice that the mechanical axis of the bone is realigned. The joint, which is supposed to have about six degrees of valgus, uh, has about six degrees of valgus compared to the diaphysis. Same thing for the, uh, the um, humeral head. How can we apply it as well in the world of foot and ankle? Well, this is a 30 year old that came to me from China and he had uh, an eight-year history from um, 
um, removal of a hemang uh, intramuscular hemangioma in the calf. And he developed after that terrible stiff equinus contracture. But that's not even what he showed up for. He presented for a leg length discrepancy because this is a weight bearing x-ray. This is an, all the, the range of motion he has. What you see is what you get. He has no dorsiflexion, no plantar flexion, but this is a 55 degree equinus contracture. So I skipped a little the map VABC here because the world of map VABC is slightly different in foot and ankle, but I still used it. And the deformity is in the equinus. The, um, the goal is to realign the mechanical axis of the tibia to the mechanical axis of the hind foot. And the mechanical axis of the hind foot is established by a line that goes perpendicular to the weight bearing surface of the foot, 90 degrees going through the lateral process of the talus. And if you plan these, and if, the, if there's really pure equinus contracture, the deformities of the ankle, the deformity should always lay at the subtalar joint, always lay at the subtalar joint. Now, doing an acute correction of an eight year long standing um, equinus contracture is very dangerous for soft tissues, for the neurovascular bundle. And actually, even if you do a long, if you try doing a long tendo Achilles lengthening, capsular release, recession of all the tendons, this, this ankle is so stiff that short of shortening the joint and really maybe either fusing or shortening the tibia, it's going to be excessively difficult to correct uh, acutely. So we opted for a gradual correction of this ankle with external fixation. And this patient was kind enough and smart enough to take some pictures daily of his correction. And I decided to do a time lapse of that so you can see that over the course of three months, it took three months to obtain this correction. Over the course of three months, this is what happened to this patient. So I'm gonna stop talking so you can have a look and, I, and I'll narrate a little bit. Um, over the course of three months, you can see as he starts correcting the deformity, how almost without resistance or it seem, seemingly without resistance, his foot goes into neutral position. And we tend to overcorrect a little bit these deformities up to 15 degrees here. Um, 15 degrees, because there is going to be a spring back of the soft tissues. The soft tissues have a memory and will want to go back into the neutral position. So that sweet spot has been studied to about 15 degrees where we obtain about 15 degrees of, of, um, of dorsiflexion. We keep that deformity, that uh, overcorrection for about six weeks. And then we re remove the external fixator. Those are the x-rays after the deformity correction. And this patient who was not able to move before, all of a sudden started having dorsiflexion and plantar flexion. And all he wanted was to play basketball. This is him walking. And that day we cried a little bit in, uh, in clinic. It cha this changed his life. He had found no one who wanted or, or, or was willing to treat him. He went from an ankle that was stiff and in equinus without movement to an ankle with movement. And it's because the, his muscles were so stretched by the contracture that it had lost all contractile power, according to Sterling's law. Once the balance between the muscles were restored, this patient was able to uh, regain movement. Let's go back into the world of Matt DBC if we have time, uh, maybe take a few more minutes to, um, to look at this intraarticular non-union patient who was treated uh, conservatively for a lateral distal femoral condyle, and that condyle had shifted superiorly and posteriorly with the, uh, with the nefarious effect that he was, he had no pain, but he was having severe valgus, incapacity to straighten his, his uh, knee, and wanted correction. So I did a little time lapse as well of the surgical correction. So we'll go step by step through uh, how to how to technically correct those with an acute correction. So we had two options here. We could do a takedown of the non-union through the articular surface where the CT scan showed that it was a full non-union, but the patient had no pain, only deformity. So 
taking down an intraarticular non-union, doing an arthrotomy, uh, subluxing the patella is very morbid, creates a lot of arthrofibrosis in an already stiff joint. And it's, I'm not a good surgeon. I can't do that. So instead, I decided to correct his intraarticular deformity, restoring the map DBC. I went through that whole method again. And, and instead, doing an extraarticular deformity to address his complaint. Don't just look at the problem. Look at the patient. Look at the patient's reality. And I know that, that for some of you, uh, of our colleagues who take upon very, very complex patients, very complex problems in India, you, you, you do know the social aspects of your, of your correction. You do know how to uh, tailor your, patient, your care to the patient's need. So here, we first start by marking the joint. We mark the joint, we mark the osteotomy level, and we perform a, uh, we perform a um, multiple drill hole, low velocity osteotomy by creating that multiple drill hole line that you see here. I position a temporary X-fix, monolateral X-fix from lateral to medial, and I find the entry point with a hemostat on fluoroscopy. Um, and I, I do cannulated method and I insert that pin, making sure that it's outside of the way of my external fixator. The second pin more proximal is in the uh, lesser trochanter, posterior to the, the predicted at, um, path of the nail. And the osteotomy is completed with an osteotome by doing a very low velocity osteotomy. It does not create a lot of heat. It has a good healing potential. You confirm the, uh, the completion of the osteotomy with translation. So you get, here you can see translation of the osteotomy. There were better views to, to see that translation, but you really wanna have translation. And first, when you perform that correction, it has to fit the planning. And the first step is to input that translation. If you don't cut the, the bone at the apex of the deformity, and remember here, the deformity is at the joint. I didn't correction above. So there has to be correction. I have to realign the axes to uh, realign those axes. So I import translation and finally angulation. And I try to mimic my planning. I, I lock the, the external fixator and I look at the, I look at the um, mechanical axis either by using a bovie cord or electrocautery cord uh, or a hard, stiff guide rod. But it has to be stiff. It can't bend or it has to be kept in tension. So the center of the hip, I try to recreate the, the mechanical axis deviation. So center of the hip, center of the ankle, and center of the knee. And what you can find here is that the correction goes straight in the center of the knee. So I'm happy with this correction that the patient should be happy with this correction. Then it's just a nail. We insert the nail according to the appropriate method, ream, span, go higher up to the, uh, than, the, uh, than the lesser trochanter, lock the nail, but the key here in this, in this example is not just the locking screws, but it's the blocking screws. The blocking screws will prevent that correction from springing back into this previous position. So what you can see here is that I put my blocking screws where I do not want the bone to go back. I wanna create a wall. I wanna create a wall from the, that lateral portion of the nail to the nail to stiffen up the construct and prevent the bone from coming back. There's a very good article uh, um, published by a, a gentleman from India in conjunction with Dr. Um, Robert Rosbrook. He calls it the reverse rule of thumb. And basically, you put your, locking, your blocking screws according to where your thumbs would be to correct the deformity on the other side. So it's the reverse rule of thumb. So what would I do to correct the deformity? And I put the screws on the opposite side of my thumbs. I start by drilling, making sure that the, the drill is exactly where I want it to be. And then I insert a screw in its place to prevent the bone from going back. And I do the same thing uh, anteriorly in this, in this, posteriorly in this situation, because I also corrected some, a little bit of procurvatum. 
two blocking screws. I recheck the mechanical axis. The mechanical axis looks good. Let's see if once the patient is healed, that correction is preserved. And you owe this preservation of the correction to the blocking screws, really. Blocking screws is what matters. And this patient went from not using, not using a, uh, a cane, or sorry, they went from using a cane and a walker to walking independently and, and happy, no pain. And what you can notice is that despite the fact that I did not address the non-union, I still stimulated the bone and the non-union went on to full healing. So although the joint doesn't look perfect, he's happy, the, the limb is realigned. And now at least in the future, the, the joint is a little bit more amenable to an intra-articular correction should this patient ever need a uh, knee replacement. So in conclusion, there's so many other deformity scenarios. We just looked at a few coming from the tibia, coming into the femur, coming from both, coming from the foot. But any, any non-union scenario that you can think, bone defect, osteomyelitis, leg length discrepancy, angular deformities, name it, you, it can be there. But limb deformity assessment is not just the, uh, the tools of the deformity surgeon. It should be the skill set that every orthopedic surgeon has to understand their joint practice, to understand their sports medicine practice, to understand their foot and ankle practice, oncology practice, name it. And don't forget to assess the patient as a whole. Now, unfortunately, we, are, we, we give this course usually over the course of four days. So these two hours, is very condensed, but uh, we just scratched the surface. Go to HTTPS, don't forget the S, uh, colon slash last deformity course dot s w o o g o dot com slash 2020 bar virtual and sign up to the course this year it's highly discounted uh, you'll have about two months to look at all to read all the lectures there's going to be two days of virtual sessions and please register now now you can also visit our websites can follow us on Instagram. I started an Instagram where we do educational uh, cases where I go over the method, I go over the pros and cons, but not only the goods. I do what I call the good, the bad, and the ugly. What are the good points? What are the bad points? What should be improved in our method? And what are the complications that we faced? And I think that's something that all, all orthopedic surgeons should start doing uh, so that we can grow as surgeons and become better. I have a few more examples, but I think for now, I am done with my time. I want to take questions, and I want uh, Dr. Shatan and anyone else to present their case if they can. Dr. Shadari. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Uh, I think uh, eye-opener cases look very difficult, but I think the way you analyze them, it all looks you know, like child's play in your hand. But of course, we have um, a lot of questions that are coming up, a lot of um, uh, learning points that we'd like to ask. And um, I believe Parag has the first question coming up for you. Parag, uh, over to you, please. Oh, uh, excellent talk, uh, Michael. Very complex deformities. Uh, uh, one of the slides you showed that you have also uh, an option of a totally replacement to correct deformities. So since I'm a more of a totally replacement surgeon, you know, I have a bias to that. So when do you decide that what is your cutoff that this case merits a deformity correction and salvaging the joint? Uh, and when do you just pass on the case to your joint replacement colleague? So what's your cutoff to decide the knee replacement versus salvaging the joint? That is an excellent question. And really, it's, it's a step, it's a case by case analysis. Whereas uh, one of my key points in the conclusion is look at the patient as a whole. And and all those knee replacements, deformity correction, tibia osteotomy, femur osteotomy, they're all tools that the surgeon should have in their armamentarium. And the answer is this patient was 38 and young and active and desired to run. So although a knee replacement in a knee like that, subluxed, arthritic, painful, could be, be a very good option, if the patient is below the age of 60, if the patient is healthy, can tolerate a, uh, a period of non-weight bearing without losing a lot of bone density or losing a lot of muscle mass, 
if uh, the patient wants to keep on skiing or, or maybe running, biking, being very physically active, then I go towards the route of the deformity correction. Mm -hmm. I've, or if the patient doesn't want a joint replacement, the patient comes to me and wants a second opinion because, and there's a little bias in my perception here where I think if the patient can keep their native parts, it's always better than to give spare parts because a knee replacement has a, has a lifespan. And although nowadays a knee replacement can last 25 years, some will say 30 years. Well, in 25 years, this patient won't even be 60. And the best knee replacement is always the first. Yeah, yeah, I take your point uh, uh, well answered, you know, but since you're into deformity correction, I think that's in your hands. But at times as a joint replacement surgeon, you tend to think differently. The problem comes when the patient has arthritis, you know, and then is the real question. If the patient has no arthritis, I completely agree with you that, you know, uh, salvage is the way to go. Uh, now, an, another point that's very important, and I talked about the good, right? But the, let's talk about the ugly. Let's talk about the problems. I had this 70-year-old lady sent to me by a partner who, uh, uh -huh. um, who had knee arthritis, but also defor deformities. And she wanted an alternative to a knee replacement, 72-year-old woman. And I opted for the deformity correction and sued the late union insufficiency fractures of the pelvis and sufficiency fracture of the of the um of the subtrochanteric area and it took a year to a year and a half before getting her back on her feet that was a mistake that was a mistake the knee replacements should have been but there's that's a, yeah. that's why you call it practicing medicine yeah i noticed prof has a comment to make and then we go to the next question uh, unmute yourself prof <clears throat> no, it's, um, those are great cases, Michael. <clears throat> you know, Michael joined us a few years ago, and um, a lot of those uh, big complex cases um, came to see me, and I <clears throat> referred them to Michael because it's these young guys that have all the vim and vigor and uh, can uh, tackle these big cases uh, with uh, grace and aplomb. And so I just want to congratulate you, Michael, on some really good work. Thank you, but Professor. You're, you're also young, bro. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, over to the next question. Yeah, Michael, uh, my question for you is that, uh, you know, given the example where you, sh the last case that you showed, where you used a nail with blocking screws for correcting a deformity at, say, the lower th or the metaphyseal diaphyseal junction of uh, the distal femur. So, what exactly is the process for you to decide? whether you should fix it with a plate or a nail. So what's the decision point that we have to decide, okay, yes, we can do it both with a plate and a nail, but here's when I would definitely want to use a plate and here's when I would definitely want to use a nail. That's a very, very good question. And uh, I went back and forth in the past few years. Now, in the classic idiopathic genu valgum or genu varum, where the apex of the deformity is very close to the joint, my preferred method is to do an incomplete osteotomy and a high tibial osteotomy or, dis or, or a distal femoral osteotomy, whereas I use the medial cortex of the femur, the lateral cortex of the tibia, bone graft and apply plate. But for that, I want the deformity to be very close to the joint so that my osteotomy can be oriented very close to the apex. We do the osteotomy close to the apex not to induce a deformity translation, not to induce uh, any joint obliquity. Now, if the apex of the deformity is far from the joint, then I try to use a nail. Why do I like a nail? Well, a nail is a, is a load sharing implant that is, that is not off axis. It's in the it cl very close to the mechanical axis of the femur. So I can start having my patient bear weight much quicker on a nail than I can on a plate because the plate is off axis, so holds uh, through the plates. Uh, if I need to input translation and I cannot have any good um, friction between the plate and the bone, I will try not to use a plate as I've noticed that two stiff constructs can, yield, can lead to non-union as well so really that's my thought process how far of the how far is the deformity from the joint 
can I get away with an incomplete osteotomy in a plate or do I need a nail? If the, if the, if the deformity is in that diaphysis, then I don't even think. I go, if I can, if the patient has uh, closed growth plates, I go with the nail. Yeah. Does the quality of bone or, you know, the presence of, uh, say, vitamin D deficiency or, uh, you know, osteoporosis also have an impact on your decision process? Metabolic diseases, comorbidities definitely have an impact. Uh, as, a, as a rule of thumb, one should never treat the patient with osteogenesis imperfecta with a plate, with a short plate. Or uh, in case of rickets, you may want to span the whole bone. You want to create a rebar out of the bone, create some reinforced concrete. Uh, so definitely the answer is uh, the bone quality, metabolic bone disorders, osteoporosis will all have an impact in so the choice. In which way does it have an impact? If there is osteoporosis, if it's metabolic, your tilt is towards what modality? I'm, I'm sorry, I, I, um, I didn't... So if, there is, if there is osteoporosis, if there is a metabolic disease, so how does it impact your decision? What do you decide to do then? You know, how, what kind of modality of fixation do you use? Well, then it becomes a multidisciplinary approach. Whereas I send the patient to a rheumatologist uh, or an endocrinologist, depending on, on the patient, where, uh, where I want them to be optimized first. I want their bone density to be as high as we can. If the patient has some other comorbidities that are amenable to uh, bisphosphonates, you can, you can have them get bisphosphonates as well. Um, then the answer is, it depends on their age. If, the, if it's a mild deformity and, and the correction can be corrected through the joint with arthritis and I can allow weight, immediate weight bearing, the patient is elderly, joint replacement all the way. If the patient is younger and, and should keep his native parts, then I make that decision depending on which implant, location of osteotomy, multidisciplinary approach. All patients get vitamin D supplementation. Um, I, I, it has happened that I've, give, I've uh, referred patients to nutritionists or dietitian for dietitian uh, care as well. So really it becomes a multidisciplinary approach okay. and everyone makes a decision together. And I reach out to Dr. Hertzenberg and ask for his, his opinion. Yeah. Uh, Chetan, you had a question? Yes, Michael, extraordinary cases. Congratulations. I have two Thank questions. You. First is the humerus case that you showed. So in, you have used a, a TSF, I believe. So my question is, uh, can one get away, since you had an acute correction and compression, can one use a monolateral fixator like an orthofix in a similar scenario? That is my first question. My second question is, in long-standing uh, severe virus deformities like the Blount's case that you showed, at the end of mechanical axis correction, is there a situation where you have residual soft tissue laxity like a LCL laxity which requires secondary soft tissue procedures? Yes. So, go for yes. so let's start with the first uh, question. So the answer to the uh, to your question about can you use a monolateral fixer? The answer is yes. You have to be mindful, however, of where the uh, where the um, neurovascular structures are. You want to avoid them in your uh, in your pin placement. And the second thing is I still abide to the AO principles. Whereas if I if I were to use a plate for compression, I would under contour the plate which means that if you are going to use a monolateral fixer, the tendency, if you compress, it's off axis, right? If you compress, you're going to create a valgus moment. So you may want to position your pins with a little bit of convergence that will mimic your under contour so that when you compress, you, um, you compress evenly on the joint. That's one. Two, right. have a long working distance as well. So pins close to the fracture site, pins far from the fracture site, and three pins, three pins should, should suffice. So think neurovascular structure, think biomechanics, and uh, and just good non-union prin uh, fixation principles. For your second question, um, the answer is yes. The answer is yes. So the question was, uh, in the severe blount with joint subluxation, when once you correct the, the, the joint, uh, the, the extraarticular deformity, do you still ha have um, joint laxity, yes. There's two ways to address the problem. If you use a gradual correction, you can avoid fixing the fibula and pull the fibula down. 
it is not without complications. Some patients report, you know, uh, tightness of the, the hamstrings, a little bit of pain at the hamstrings, some tendonitis, but usually conservative treatment can be enough to, to take care of that. And it tightens the joint. If you do an acute correction, uh, you can either perform soft tissue reconstruction, so posterior lateral corner reconstruction, LCL reconstruction, uh, or, or whichever ligament is, is lax yourself. I tend to do it in the second stage because then I know what I'm dealing with, right? I know what the alignment is. I, I, you have your final picture. However, I team up with, sp with sports surgeons to do that because I want to have the best man for the job right. to, uh, to be able to do that. Yeah. Yes, so take Excellent. away the rough Excellent. estimate of the incidence of the secondary procedure, soft tissue procedure requirement. I, I would not have that uh, that number. It's a good question. That's room for uh, room for uh, research there. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. I think uh, we have about uh, fifteen minutes left, and uh, we have uh, two interesting cases uh, from Dr. Milin. So uh, we will ask Dr. Milin to share his screen, and then. We will have a discussion on two of these interesting cases. We have about uh, 20 minutes more, Milan. Okay. Uh, so we'll take two cases, yeah. All right. So thank you very much, uh, Parag and uh, Sachin. On behalf of the Society of Knee Surgeons of India, thank you very much for this very kind invitation. I hope you can hear me clearly. Yes. Am I audible? Much better now. Yes. Much better. Thank you. Yeah. All right, so um, with your permission, I'll be sharing a few cases. This is, um, first of all, I'd like to wish Happy Independence Day to our American guests and uh, faculty. Secondly, I'd like to show you that this is the journal, the Journal of Limb Lending and Reconstruction, uh, on which um, John, Dr. John Herzenberg is on the editorial board, and he has a fantastic article on acute deformity correction with lengthening using a motorized impermeability lens. The journal is online since the last three days. The latest issue is jlimblendrecon.org. So when we're talking deformity correction, we are with the masters, and we hope to be able to um, you know, share with you um, knee surgeons, a lot of the techniques. So since time is short, I'm going to restrict myself to a couple of interesting concepts with your permission. So this is a... 44 year old lady with significant Boeing deformity and pain in the knee joint. And, and she comes to us, she's already been told that she needs a total knee replacement, but for various reasons, she is not up to it. So when we analyze her x-rays on the full length x-ray, when we use the map principles, first we draw the mechanical axis going from the center of the femoral head to the center of the ankle, it's significantly displaced almost minus 100%. Then the next thing we do to try and find out where the deformities are, we draw the line from the center of the femoral head to the center of the knee joint. And then the joint orientation line, which is a line tangential to the femoral condyle. And the angle that is drawn laterally is the mechanical lateral distal femoral angle, which in this case is 110 degrees. So she has a significant, say, a lot of deformity in the femur. If you consider the normal as 87, this is probably 23 degrees. So then how do we determine where does the deformity lie? So since we are in the mood to perform an anatomical axis correction, we would like to find out the anatomical axis. So we try to find out the anatomical axis of the proximal fragment by drawing the midpoint of two lines in the proximal femur, and we draw the axis line over here. Similarly, we draw off the lower part and we draw the axis line. They intersect at this point, which we call the cora, which is a, makes an angle of eight degrees. Interestingly, how do we find the intersection, the apex of the deformity close to the joint? We draw the anatomical lateral distal femoral angle. It doesn't start at the center of the joint, it starts a centimeter medial to the center of the joint and goes up at 81 degrees, which is population normal. Now this line, the ALDFA line extended above, intersects with the 
anatomical axis line of the distal shaft at this point you can see over here and makes an angle of about 11 degree so we have 8 degrees here and 11 degrees so that's a lot of deformity in the femur now what about the tibia in the tibia we draw the joint orientation line of the tibia and at 87 degrees which is the normal mpta we draw the line going down from the center and we draw the anatomical axis of the distal tibial fragment they intersect at about this point, giving an angle of 7 degrees. So now we know we have two deformities in the femur, one in the tibia. And what's going on in the knee joint? We have a JLCA, that's joint line convergence angle, or the JCA, as Michael called it, of almost 6 degrees. So the, there is an opening out of the joint by 6 degrees. So there's a deformity in the joint as well. And what's difficult to show in this x ray is that there is some mismatch in the condylar height as well. So since we wanted to perform correction of the deformities and try and preserve our native knee joint, this is what we chose to perform. We chose to perform, to look at the x-ray on the left, a double level fixator assisted nailing. That's to correct both the deformities where they lie. So the important part about this is that according to the rule two of deformity correction, when you correct the varus in the lower end of the femur, we always translate the distal fragment medially at the level of the osteotomy. So here you can see that it is translated indeed a little medial. And as Michael has pointed out and as John has told us, we use the blocking screws or the polar screws to narrow the track of the nail. And this is a crucial aspect of deformity corrections using intramedullary nailing. And at the proximal level, we have performed what seems almost like an opening wedge, but it's a small deformity, it doesn't matter. And we modify these nails with extra holes so that we can correct the deformities at two levels. The interesting part is that the nails are straight nails so that they allow us to do accurate correction. And if need arises, perform lengthening whenever it is required. So on this X-ray now, you can see that it is corrected well, but there is a little bit of a condylar mismatch. So then the lady also gets the upper tibial correction by elevation of her tibial condyle. I'll come to that in a minute. This is at the end of the first stage. And then what we need to do on the opposite side is not only correct her femur, as you can see, there is some going. The deformities are similar to the ones that I showed you on the right. But the interesting thing is to go down and see what's happening in the tibia. When we have large deformities, if we look at it carefully, sometimes you have this pagoda tibia in which the two condyles of the tibia are not collinear. They are tilted to each other. Three degrees may be considered as normal, but here in this case, it's much more than that. So we elevate the tibial condyle as we perform, as John has shown us in plants, as Michael has shown us, we elevate the tibial condyle, fix it, and then perform a second osteotomy because we also have an extra articular deformity. And here she is. So when we need to perform two levels of deformity correction, the Elizaro fixator or any external fixator in the younger people is well tolerated in the tibia. And so this is her correction clinically now at the end of it. And you can see that on the right side, the femur is spot on. And therefore, as a result of which, we have a mechanical axis close to 50%. And there's no malorientation of even the ankle joint or the knee joint on the right side. On the left, we erred a little bit on undercorrection side, so the femur is not fully corrected. The tibia is a little overcorrected, and therefore there is a slight amount of, you know, the ankle joint misorientation. And this comes up frequently in the recent literature that if you overcorrect in the tibia, you may either get a knee joint line orientation or an ankle joint line orientation that's a little off of the normal. But this now we come to this, um, 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 so with your permission, John, I'd like to show this and introduce two concepts. That's the rule two of deformity correction. We have this young lady who's had an amputation on one side and the significant genu valga because of the growth arrest that she had during the trauma. Now, because of the significant deformity and the amputation, she's just not able to walk. So obviously, with the principles of deformity correction, we need to correct her valgus. 
But how do we do that? Do we put on an external fixator and gradually correct it? Which rule of deformity correction do we follow? Because if we analyze the deformities carefully, we will see that it's a very significant valgus over here, let's say minus 250 or 300%. But if we really draw the lines, the joint orientation line of the femur and the tibia shows that there's a joint line convergence angle of almost 34 degrees. So this is a compensatory deformity she's developing to enable her to keep the limb straight. But if we draw the ALDFA at 81, we find that there are two deformities, 26 and 120. So it's a huge deformity. And if we try to correct it gradually, maybe at one level, maybe at two levels, it's going to take her too long in the fixed it. So therefore, what we do is there are two aspects that I'd like to highlight. One is the rule two of deformity correction, which goes something like this. This is a standard tibia, which is shown deformed with its uh, proximal and distal anatomical axes. This is the transverse bisector line. This is the cora. And this axis is the axis of correction of angulation anywhere on the transverse bisector line. So if we perform the osteotomy away from the cora or away from the axis of correction of angulation, you're going to have some translation at the osteotomy site, but the overall axis is going to line up well. So this is rule two. So just to uh, reiterate the problem. And the second aspect is that we now employ very frequently shortening of the bone to whatever extent required to enable acute correction of large deformities without stretching the neurovascular structure. So this young girl got a lateral popliteal nerve release at all the levels and she had a dramatic resection of the bone by more than six, six and a half centimeters. And because the osteotomy is performed a little away from the apex of the deformity, we have translated the distal fragment significantly. This is during the process. So much of the deformity is corrected on the table. And within the next few days, she gets a correction. And we stop only when we get significant translation here to allow the axis to line up more or less in the center of the joint. And this is our result with the axis running more or less to the center. So because she had this, she was able to walk in the fixator. You know, you can see on the photograph very nicely within a few days with wearing her prosthesis. Had we done a gradual correction, it would have taken several months. So here she is now much better correction, reasonably good. So uh, excellent. Rule, yeah. So uh, we could stop here for questions or comments, or uh, we could, uh, like John, to give his yeah, comments so any uh, comments or questions on this case from uh, michael or prof uh, we will be happy to take them because we have about five to seven minutes more yes professor well uh milan um i just want to congratulate you on some really excellent work on some very complex cases um <clears throat> um uh it's really nice well done um so I do have a question though about this last case. You you showed us in the initial x-rays, I know it's hard to even get x-rays when they're so crooked, but on the initial x-rays, you'd showed us that there was a significant joint lateral convergence angle, 34 degrees, what you said. Yeah, and how, like did you, how did you address that? Or um, you know, how did, did that just go away when you straightened her out? Yeah, it's, it's, it's one of the compensatory deformities. She is, uh, it's happening because the weight of the lower part of the limb is just forcing the limb more vertically and the joint is opening up. And since we are doing partly acute and partly gradual correction, we are able to correct more of the bone and enable you know, full correction of the bony deformity until she's you know, fully out and you know, more or less the axis to the center. So um, uh, this was something she compensated by and by correcting the deformity, the joint doesn't need to go into the significant virus at the joint to compensate. So since we've done an adequate bony correction, we go away and for some time she's going to need some support like ACE bandages and a soft you know, a knee support. And then over time, since she's young, her joint will be able to firm up because now the axis is reasonably well correct. Do you think that someday she's gonna come back and ask you to lengthen the femur on the left side? Um, uh, she has a prosthesis on this side, 
So um, perhaps if you give a lot of importance to the level of the knee joint during walking, and if it's really going to trouble her, you're right. She may she may want to get a lengthening done. In which case, uh, I, 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 let, let me let me second guess your next question. In which I may either have to resort again to only external fixation, or I may be able to put in a nail that goes down from the trochanter and comes up here because there'll be some remodeling, and the nail may be able to go up to here, and I may be able to lend it along this axis. Mm. Uh, yeah. Is it it brings up the important point that if you have a bad knee, you lengthen at the hip. If you have a bad hip, you lengthen at the knee. And so she's got a compromised knee. So I think if, if someday she wants it and you desire it, uh, I would agree with you, do a subtrochanteric uh, thermal lengthening. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, any other questions for uh, Milan on the first case also? That was also a very nice case which you showed. Dr. Shadari, when you perform yes. these these uh, intraarticular correction, yes, how how do you ensure that you don't displace that uh, articular surface and that the joint remains nice and congruent when you restore the um, the anatomy? Yes, that's that's a really interesting technical uh, issue, and we like to pass in a in a in an ilazar of K wire. You know, once we've done the osteotomy and in the deformed position after the osteotomy is complete, after the L-shaped osteotomy is complete. So the Elizar of K-wire has got sufficient elasticity, and then we gradually spread the osteotomy apart with the arthrodesis spreader. The wire bends, and we also put in stoppers on either side using some, you know, Elizar of components so that the condyles don't spread out too much. Like we use the sleeves and a rancho cube to prevent the condyles from spreading apart. So all the action is taking place in the center, but it's not spreading apart. And, and the wire ensures that the, you know, the pagoda tibia with its, the ends of the tibial condyles being down and the intercondyl remnants being up now gets transformed the other way around and the center of the knee goes a little below, tensing the cruciates also. That's part of the theory of the Japanese people do in the TCBO. And uh, so the wire helps really in preventing a mismatch or an overriding of the condyle or too much spreading and trying to keep the joint congruent. So we go slow too during the Thank process. You. Yeah, yeah. So I think uh, we will open it up for some general questions now. Uh, okay. We have about uh, five minutes. We are already at nine o'clock and uh, India 9 p.m. and 11.30 a.m. in the U.S. So uh, any other quick questions, Sachin, Chetan, uh, uh, for our uh, panelists, uh, there's a uh, there's a question on the YouTube channel. Sure, sure. Asks is that uh, what are the indications of doing a clamp shell osteotomy? So if uh, Professor Hasselberg or uh, Dr. Michael could answer that question, that will be really great. Clam shell. Um, I guess you have to define for me what you mean by clam shell osteotomy. Yeah, I mean. <laughs> I didn't have a clue, so that's why I thought that uh, maybe I'd uh, ask either of you people to sort of uh, fill us in on this. Yeah, I have no clue. Miland? Uh, me neither. Me neither. I haven't heard of this terminology before. So anyway, so we'll pass the question for the moment. We'll get back to the uh, guy later and let you yeah, know. So so any other questions? Yeah, there's one more question. I'll just uh, bring it up in a moment. Uh, yeah, and the question is that uh, how do you decide between a closed wedge or an open wedge osteotomy for either uh, on the femur or the tibial side? And I know that this is uh, probably, you know, this will get uh, asked over and over again, especially considering that the most common osteotomy that the uh, general or the knee surgeon is likely to perform is going to be uh, you know, a high tibial osteotomy or correction of uh, genovarum. And that question always keeps getting asked over and over again is that what is better? Is it a medial open wedge or a lateral closing wedge? So I'll get you to give your thoughts on this. Um, and uh, I think that would be a question that a lot of people would have. Yes, Michael, you want to take that first? And, or, or, yes, and of course, Professor please. Uh, so it depends on the patient's needs. So you, you know that performing an open wedge will effectively lengthen the limb while closing wedge will will um, 
will shorten the limb. So you want to take into consideration limb length. That's, that's one of the reasons. The second reason is, the second uh, uh, thought process is, what's technically easier, right? And the reality of things is, it's always slightly easier to do a lateral open wedge than a medial closing wedge of the femur, whereas medially, uh, more proximally, there's very important vessels, so what I've heard, and, and nerves that uh, could be in the way of your surgical ap approach. A little bit of the same principle of the tibia. Um, laterally at the proximal tibia, uh, there is the fibular, the common perineal nerve, the, which gives us branches. There's the anterior tibial artery. There's the fibular head. So performing the classical coventry osteotomy, which shortens everything is, uh, is a little bit more challenging than doing an open wedge. And then um, anywhere in between, right? Depending on where the, the osteotomy is, uh, where the deformity is located, it's, it's just surgeon's choice. What does the patient need? What's easier or what's technically better to do? Dr. H, do you wanna supplement my answer? Yeah, so specifically the question was asked regard to high tibial osteotomies. And it used to be very popular to do a closing wedge osteotomy, the classic Coventry style osteotomy. One of the problems though, is that <clears throat> when you approach it from the lateral side and you shorten the lateral, column, you disrupt by, by necessity the tibial fibular joint. And so you literally have to take down, either take a piece of the fibula out or take down the proximal tibial fibular joint. Otherwise, you won't be able to get your osteotomy to close. So that leads to problems uh, in, with knee instability. So I, I think most of the world has gone to um, acute opening wedge medial for minor uh, sort of things, 5, 10 degrees. But when you get to 15, 20, 30 degrees or some of these massive things like the case that, that you showed, Michael, the gentleman with bilateral blounts, um, that's too much to do an acute open wedge. You, your, your OJD would be too high. Um, everyone know what OJD is? Osteocyte jumping distance. <laughs> so if you do too much of an opening wedge, you're, you know, you're going to run the risk of a non-union. So... Uh, you know, five to 10 degrees is usually acceptable, but much more than that, uh, especially in the proximal tibia can create problems. So that's where gradual uh, correction comes in. So if I may add uh, a word or two, uh, when we have deformities more than about 15 degrees, which is common in India, then you have to take into consideration the effect of an opening wedge osteotomy on the knee joint line orientation and the ankle joint line orientation. That's why a full length x-ray is a must. The osteotomy surgeons, I, I beg your indulgence in saying so, must look at full-length x-rays and not take decisions based on small x-rays. Frequently, if you need to correct larger than 15 degrees, may I suggest you should also try a dome osteotomy, which allows you larger corrections without losing bony contact. And also, the full-length x-ray may show you, as Don has shown at the very beginning, there may be some significant deformities in the femur as well. So we need to be able to do the corrections where the deformity is present and take into consideration the effect of larger deformity. Okay. So uh, any other questions? Because we are uh, about five to seven minutes uh, over time. Uh, Shamshul, uh, I believe you also do some deformity corrections. So we will give you a chance to ask the last question and then we'll go for the word of thanks. Yes, please unmute yourself and any question you want to ask Shamshul Huda. Shamshul, can you hear us? Unmute, unmute. Yeah, unmute yourself. Just, just give me a moment. Yeah. Okay. So, I think so the connection is not stable. Okay, that's fine. So we will yeah. conclude here. I am really... Uh, very thankful to our faculty, uh, Professor Herzenberg, uh, Dr. Asayag, Dr. Millen, Dr. Chetan, who took time to be here. And I request Dr. Ashok Sham uh, to say a few words. Ashok Sham yes, has sir. put this whole I'm... thing together. Ashok. Hi. Yes, I'm sure you want to go? Take a go? Yeah, yeah. Uh, you have a question, you. then go ahead. I don't have a question right now. Yeah, okay, Ashok, uh, you go yeah. ahead and then show. I, show I think it was a it. fantastic webinar and uh, we were building it up for a week.
its time now and uh, excellent content we had excellent viewership also for this and sir will say how much it is but a lot of good response and good comments and i'm sure we look forward to another one or a series of them for a period of time sure uh, neeraj unmute 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 yourself neeraj yeah. so we would like to thank dr arzenberg and dr michael asaya uh, unlike us with we are a partial lockdown you have i think started this now so it was a very uh, new type of webinar for us and uh, i have already started following you on instagram dr michael the moment i saw you i saw you put up that instagram uh, so we thank everyone and we thank ski for doing the webinar with ortho tv and we hope to continue doing webinars in associated uh, society of knee surgeons thank you very much and bye bye uh, thank you neeraj i want to request uh, samshul to say yeah thank you sir thank you very much sir uh, it's a real pleasure to hear uh, dr hazar bhai here and dr asayak last year i had been to baltimore uh, for the course it was a wonderful course there and after the course i was uh, there for observation also for a week with dr mas uh, asayak is uh, more like a teacher and a friend also and i learned a lot from hazar bhai so it's been a real pleasure learning him seeing him again and again this time so this was a wonderful webinar sir thank you from the side thank you sir yes, so sachin uh, before we close few words from you i think uh, you know rather than closing words parag i think uh, we have a request here couple of people have written uh, they'd like uh, you know they'd like to have the link for uh, professor rosenbergs and dr michael's virtual course to be shared with them sure. so i think uh, may i please request uh, ashok to send all the attendees a link or maybe a you know a pdf of the brochure with the link embedded in it so that uh, you know that would enable that them to sign up for the course so i think parag i'll sort of have a request or not closing words i think this will be yeah so professor rosenberg you want to tell us how to go about this yes uh, so uh, we would certainly welcome everyone to join us uh, for our 30th annual baltimore limb deformity course uh, to the easiest way to find us is just um, deformitycourse.com so just classic website deformity course no spaces no dots deformitycourse.com perfect so we will also spread the word professor and uh, uh, i'm sure you will have a lot of registrations uh, uh, from india come in the course you held in pune just a few months ago was fantastic and we were actually looking forward to course this year but even i'm sure you didn't imagine that your 30th course would be a virtual one when you were in india no. so 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 things have changed and You know the best thing is that you've got to adapt to the change, and you've done very well. Uh, I think this must be the first virtual course uh, from the United States I've heard of. So I'm sure you're going to set an example there. We will definitely join the course. I'm sure uh, the seven participants here with you will get a special offer for the course. <laughs> <laughs> Just Absolutely. joking, but 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 thanks uh, thanks Milan and uh, thanks Chetan also. So. from Thank on you. behalf of uh, the executive committee of uh, knee society of india and ortho tv i uh, thank prof rosenberg uh, for joining in he gave us more than 2 hours dr asaya thank you so much it was really interesting we have so many questions but i think we'll have to wait for another time when we will join you again so once again thank you and ashok neeraj and shamshu you've done a great job I believe there are 4300 people viewing you at this point of time which is an immense a big number thanks ashok for your efforts and thanks neeraj and shamshu thank you for now and we sign off thank you thank you, thank you very bye much bye bye, bye, -bye. <clears throat>